Welcome back to part three of my ongoing saga to make a one-tenth scale shipping container. Shipping container roofs. Roofs? Roofs are a funny thing. They don't have to carry any weight when the containers are stacked, as that all goes through the corner posts. That's why you will commonly see 40-foot boxes on top of two 20-foot boxes. The posts all line up fine and the weight is transferred no problem. But the other way around doesn't work. All this weight is directly on the weakest point of the lower container. And there's no way to lock those corners down, which could be even worse in transit. But I did find this picture of it in the wild, so it happens, but it's weird. Roofs do have to deal with the elements, however, which mostly means being able to shed water reliably. One of the common alloys used in making containers is weathering steel, which has the very convenient property of resting a bit and then stopping, like what aluminum does, basically. I've used it myself in large permanent sculptures, it's great stuff. But the one thing you don't want is to leave it sitting in water, because then it will just rust like normal steel. So the roof can't just be flat, and it definitely can't bow down in the middle. The standard solution is to have a slight arch in the roof from side to side, and to emboss the steel with these stiffening features, which posed a conundrum for my project. They couldn't be bent with the brake, they had to be pressed into shape. So I started experimenting. I started with the absolute dumbest idea possible, milling a slot into some scrap wood and using a ball peen hammer. It didn't work in the slightest. But it got my blood flowing, at least, so I found the motivation to make a more realistic die set. The lower piece still has a shallow slot in it, but I added an upper guide piece and a dynamic die to be pushed down into the slot. This was done by a little hydraulic press or a dead blow mallet. And it worked surprisingly well. The embossed sections looked really great for just an hour's worth of effort. But there were still some issues. Getting the upper and lower dies lined up was a pain, and getting the spacing and parallelism between the embossings was really tricky. The next version aiming at a full 120mm width would have to solve these problems. I made it out of half-inch cold roll bar, an inch and a half wide. The lower piece had two shallow slots this time, so the previous embossing could sit in the second one and set the spacing. The lower piece had tapped holes so the upper guide could be screwed down onto it. This keeps the alignment between them correct, and also clamps the sheet metal into place. The upper piece still just had a slot in it, but much thicker this time to guide the moving punch better. Finally, I rounded the ends of the punch using a radius cutter, so it fit the guide slot perfectly. It all felt good, like a real tool. But would it work? Unfortunately, I got carried away testing it and didn't film the first tests. The results were... vaguely acceptable, I guess. It was too wide for the hydraulic press to handle, so I started hammering on it with the dead blow. That sometimes worked well, but not reliably. I tried using the shorter punch from the previous test, which concentrated the power well, but left ugly marks on the ends, even after I ground them down to a nice taper. And while the spacing between the embossings was great, the left-right spacing was pretty bad. There was just too much slop for the second slot to constrain that motion well enough. Third attempt. I milled a very shallow recess into the lower die, half the thickness of the sheet metal, exactly as wide as the piece was supposed to be. This would lock the sheet into place left and right, eliminating that last degree of freedom. I ground down the business end of the dynamic die some, to give more room for the sheet metal to move. And then I got back to experimenting. This time, out of frustration, I started using the driving hammer on the full width die. I hadn't used it before, not wanting to mushroom out the top of the die, but I figured I should just give it a go, and it worked great. I'm seriously pleased with the results. I didn't think it would get anywhere near this good. But I'm not 100% happy with the spacing. I didn't account for the width used up in the tapering sides of the embossings, so the crests and troughs aren't evenly sized like they should be. I'm still debating if I should completely remake the upper and lower die set to fix it. I like being a perfectionist, but... I'm not sure even I would notice the issue if I wasn't looking at a blueprint. But that will have to wait, because I've started to work on the new fabrication table. That will be the subject of the next video, so catch you then!